This is the 41st lecture of the course MTH204A, first section B. You recall that in the last lecture we were talking about the Burnside's theorem. So, basically, we talked about two theorems due to Burnside, and we have seen that the second theorem implies the first theorem. Now, in this lecture, we will pro pro prove the second theorem. So, this is the statement of the second theorem. It says that if a finite group, uh, it, add, it, if it contains a conjugacy class, uh, namely the conjugacy class of the element G having order uh, a non-trivial conjugacy class having order some power of uh, prime, then the group cannot be simple. So, uh, in order to prove this, let us uh, make a few observations. So, as usual, let me uh, let, uh, let me recall that. So, in the rest, I mean, uh, in what follows? So, we assume that W i rho i, i from 1 up to k, these are all mutually non isomorphic infinite dimensional irreducible representation of G over C. Okay. And also we denote by n i dimension of w i dimension of w i and uh, character of rho i we denote this by uh, uh, chi i for all i. Okay. And by relabeling we further assume that chi 1 is the, is the trivial character is the trivial character. So, that is the character of the trivial representation. So, now let us come here. So, uh, recall that the column orthogonality relations that says that i from 1 up to k chi i g chi i 1. Remember g and, one, g and identity they cannot be conjugate to each other and uh, we can put a bar here, but that does not matter because it is a near positive integer. This is 0. Now, uh, for i equal to 1, what we are, we are having the trivial character. So, therefore, 1 plus i from 2 up to, to k zero. ok. So, this further implies that I should put P here. This further implies that minus 1 by P. So, you see that the right hand side being a frac proper fraction, it cannot be an algebraic integer. So, therefore, that forces that there must be a sum and in this sum which is not an algebraic integer. There exists I in such that of course, this the term chi g times chi on chi i of 1 by p is not an algebraic integer. So, is not an algebraic integer. Okay. And this further implies the following that first of all, for that i chi g chi i g cannot be 0 and of course, because if it is 0 then it will be 0. So, automatically this will be an algebraic integer and also this part cannot be an integer. So, that is p does not divide chi i of 1. Okay. So, chi i of 1 is just the dimension. Uh, so, namely according to our notation this is just n i. All right. So, therefore, now you see, so p does not divide this, 
but however this has only so the order the only prime divisor of the order of the conjugacy class of g is p right so therefore so hence yeah hence this fellow of course this is this fellow and or co prime yeah or relatively prime and then what does that imply this implies that therefore there exist integers a and b such that okay what is there so a times this quantity plus b times chi i of 1 is 1 this is this follows from Bayes theorem now furthermore uh, <coughs> let us bring the following into the picture so divide by chi 1 i and multiply both sides by chi i g so a g by c g g chi 1 y plus Okay. This is what we obtain. Now recall that while proving dimension theorem, the one of the main observations that we have uh, made there that is in while proving that the dimension of a reducible representation divides that or uh, divides the order of G, one of the crucial observation was for any group element and any reducible character, this quantity is an algebraic integer. Okay. This, this is the observation that we have made namely passing through this uh, like we consider uh, we, I mean we work with the left regular representation then restricted that uh, to irreducible subspaces in or uh, since all irreducible representations occur as a sub representation in the uh, in the left uh, occur yeah occurs as a sub representation in the left regular representation of G. So, from that it follows that whatever reducible character you take, this quantity is going to be an algebraic integer. So, this is an algebraic integer, this is an algebraic integer, this forces this to be an algebraic integer. Therefore, is an algebraic integer. this fellow is an algebraic integer. Now, of course, this cannot be 0 right because chi i g cannot be 0. So, this is an algebraic integer. So, I should say this is a non-zero algebraic integer. Okay. Now, we have an estimate for such things. Recall that for any character chi, chi i I mean for any character chi, chi i g divided by chi, I mean chi g divided by chi 1 the absolute value is bounded above by 1. Okay. So, therefore, what do we have about this quantity? So, first of all this is non-zero okay. and this is less or equal to 1 that we know can it be equal I mean can it be strictly less than 1? Of course not because the lemma that we have proved in the last class that shows that if some if for a character this is strictly lies between if this strictly lies between 0 and 1 then this cannot be an algebraic integer. So, actually this force says that this absolute value must be equal to 1. Okay. So, so, the next question is what happens if the absolute value is equal to 1? Remember that how we obtain the upper bound. So, so recall that. So, the rho i was the representation, right. So, corresponding to that g rho i g was a linear map from w to 
W i since this was a so this was a finite order. So this linear map, this linear operator is having finite order. Therefore, its minimal polynomial will be divisor of some x to the power m minus one. Hence, its all roots will be distinct. Hence, that forces this to be rho i g has to be a diagonalizable operator, and the eigenvalues are that those m m in some m th some uh, m th roots of unity. So the thing is. Uh, they are by some app, uh, relative to some appropriate basis. So, this observation again I am telling you that uh, we have already made several times relative to some appropriate ordered basis. The matrix of rho g matrix of rho i g because is can yeah is brought to this some omega 1 up to some omega n where so where okay i think uh, where uh, for some m each omega i is an mth root of unity of unity. some mth root of unity and therefore, chi i will be just their sum right. So, the point that I want to make is, so therefore, chi i is just their sum ok, ah, I think here it is just n i because the matrix will be having size n i. So, this is just their sum and now if this becomes 1 then what does that mean? So, this chi i g is clearly seen to be less or equal to n i. Now, this is 1 means the equal there will be an equality here. So, that means this if this happens then for this complex number we will have equality occurring in the triangle inequality. So, this implies this condition equality occurs see yeah uh, equality holds in the triangle inequality for these numbers this complex numbers for the complex numbers ok. Now, let uh, let us recall the necessary and sufficient condition for which we will have equality in the triangle inequality for complex numbers because right now you are working with complex numbers only. So, given a set of complex numbers let us say z 1 up to z m z m or z l if the if they are the absolute value of the sum equals to the sum of the absolute values then all these all this z i's must have same argument that is the angle all of I mean they must have the same angle with the positive x axis. Okay, that is quite clear because all of them have to be like on a on a ray. So, that for that forces that all of them must have the same angle. So, they can only differ by magnitude, but now all of these 
like WJs are already in, they are having absolute value 1. So, thus we have some complex numbers having equal absolute value namely 1 and uh, because of the equality in the triangle inequality, they are also having same argument. So, what do we obtain? So, again try to understand, sir, we are given a collection of complex numbers, they have same magnitude and because of the equivalent triangle inequality, they are also having same argument. So, that means automatically they are equal, they are equal. So, they are equal. So, once all these um, Wi's are all these omega i's are equal, so that means this matrix will be a scalar matrix, right. And uh, if the matrix of uh, rho i g with respect to some basis is a scalar matrix, then actually the operator is just the operator is itself, operator is nothing but uh, scalar that scalar times identity. So, let me write it here. I think the proof is almost over. So, okay. I can also erase the statement as well. So, like uh, since W i's are equal, it follows that it follows that rho i g equal to lambda times identity for, for some lambda is in C. In fact, lambda will be like any w j because they are all equal. Okay. Now, let us come to the main, let us come to the final stage of the argument. So, if, so if j is simple, then this homomorphism from G L to G L W I must be 1 1 right, because from simplicity either it will be either the image is trivial or either kernel is whole of G or kernel is trivial right. Kernel whole of G means the representation is a trivial representation, but you see that uh, this I is at least 2. And uh, the, the, the way we started with in the very beginning, we said that the rho, rho chi 1 is the trivial character, that is, uh, rho 1 is the trivial representation, all other representations are non trivial by our choice. So, therefore, therefore, like uh, the kernel cannot be trivial because rho is non, because rho i is non trivial. So, therefore, rho i g is isomorphic to g. So, injective group homomorphism, right. Now, you see that this rho, this small rho i g, now observe that observe that rho i g, namely this Keller multiples times identity actually commutes with all rho i x, where x in g, because this is a g invariant linear operator on w and uh, so yeah, so try, so this try to understand, so this lies in this lies in, so this no, uh, I cannot say this is g invariant. So uh, let me again frame my argument. Uh, so 
this lies in GLWI okay? and this being a scalar multiple identity lies in the center of GLWI. So like for any already you know, you know in one of the previous assignments we have uh, determined the center of the general linear group. So this lies in the center of this general linear group right. So there so in particular so therefore this commutes with all rho i x right all rho i x fine. So that is rho i of g x is rho i of x g right for every x. So it is almost now done. Since this big in the centers in particular this will image with this will uh, commute with every element of the image. So therefore this shows that in particular this rho i g lies in the center of the image as well. Okay. Because rho i g that, lie, that, that lies in the image and this commutes with every element of the image. So this will lie in the center of the image. Okay. Now again we, isom we, use, we will use that these two are isomorphic. So if rho, uh, so if small rho i g lies in the center of the image, so that will force g will lie in the center of g. So try to understand, so this isomorphism, so this isomorphism of course preserves the center. So if we have something in the center of rho i g, then this pre-image has to be in the center of g. So this forces, so this, this implies this g lies in the center of g. Hence, so that center of G is non trivial. Okay. So, all this started when if we assume G is simple, now center is non trivial, and in the beginning of this phase of the argument, we, are, we started with assuming G is simple. So, from this, it will follow that g will be equal to center of g that is g is abelian but uh, this is not allowed because you see if this abelian then every conjugacy class will be trivial okay so it cannot then it cannot have a conjugate non trivial conjugacy class g cannot have a non trivial conjugacy class but by your assumption this is simply a contradiction this is a contradiction So thus we prove the second theorem due to Burnside and uh, once the second theorem is proved already we have seen that how second theorem implies first theorem. Then we further uh, see we have also seen that how the first theorem implies that uh, every group of order p to the power a times q to the power b is uh, solvable. Okay. So that proves the whole uh, the, I mean that finishes the whole Burnside business. The reason for uh, talking about Burnside's theorem and proving this in this course is to show you as I have already said the study of the groups does not complete unless you study their represent characters and representations. So this is basically a classic example that shows how influential, how powerful this representation theoretic techniques are. So if you look at the result. I mean either the statement of the second theorem or for first theorem or even the statement regarding the solvability. So the results are purely group theoretic. 
it does, in the statement there is no reference of any representation or any character. The results are very purely group theoretic, but the usual group theoretic techniques which we know they do not, they do not seem to be much uh, useful there. On the other hand, in, uh, on the other hand employing the techniques namely the characters and their relations I mean the basic properties of characters. So, I mean uh, employing this character theoretic approach we can prove those statements, we can prove the statements. So, the thing is as again I said the result is purely group theoretic, but uh, like uh, employing representation theoretic techniques namely the basic properties of studying the, I mean, studying the characters using the basic properties of the characters one proves the theorem. Okay, so uh, the, the aim that I had just to show you the how uh, to make you realize that uh, how, how influential or how powerful these techniques are. I think I am done with that. Next uh, for the rest of this lecture and the next lecture we will uh, talk about uh, something some advanced topic uh, topics in uh, group theory namely finitely generated abelian groups and its structure theorem. So, let me first start with uh, free abelian groups. Okay. So, what is a free abelian group? What is a free abelian group? So, of course, it has to be an abelian group. Let G be an abelian group. Let G be an abelian group. So, what do you mean by a free abelian group? If an abelian group has a basis. So, what is what do you mean by a basis? So, a subset. A subset S of G is said to be a said to be a basis of basis of G if okay, if for every small G, so every small G. Uh, for uh, for every small g, okay. Every small g it can be written as as so can be uniquely written as I will explain this condition one by one. Can be uniquely written as summation. N uh, x times x, where uh, x is in S, N x is in this, and N x is zero. So apparently, in a group, so this uh, only finite sums, because what in abelian group by a sum I mean like uh, operating uh, finitely many elements. So that's written in the additive notation. And also in a fine abelian group when you write n times g that actually in the multiple, so that actually means that we are, a, I mean uh, we are uh, operating g with itself n times. So, these are the standard additive notations which are convenient. So, look if the sum is infinite then there, there could be a problem that that may not make any sense. So, in order to avoid that we take only finite, only if, uh, sums which I mean, the coefficients vanish outside uh, all but finitely many coefficients vanish for all but finitely many x in s okay so what 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 does it say it says that Whenever we are having a element group element G, then we will have finitely many points, x1 finitely many points, 
such finite limit points, let us say like uh, let us say some x1 and xn such that finite limit points such that and finite limit points and positive integers n1 up to uh, ok if I say x1 up to xm n1 up to mm such that this holds ok. So, every group element can be written as a integral combination of some finitely many elements from S okay. and this represent this I mean the, the, the representation of G representation of this element I mean do not confuse that in the, with the representation in the previous uh, sense. So, this expression so, the, so this expression is unique. So, you see like uh, it should not be difficult for you to understand that this is nothing but the definition is almost similar to that of a basis in a vector space, but here instead of vector space we are only having an abelian group and uh, like in the vector space coefficients used to come from the field. Now, here the quote unquote coefficients are from integers. Okay. So, every group element, so given any group element g we know that it can be written, it can be written uniquely as a sum of this form where of course, it is actually a finite sum and uh, it is actually a finite sum where each n x is an integer. Okay. So, to say, put in simple words given any g we have elements x such that this holds. Okay. Now, uh, the thing is uh, like uh, when we write like this the uniqueness I mean to talk about uniqueness might be an issue unless we unless we say that we will not allow 0 coefficients. Okay. Because like even in the case like, like that of vector spaces you see when we, we really need to work with two vectors where like we had we, I mean it, it becomes uh, almost necessary and it becomes almost necessary to represent them by same set of x i s. So, in that case what we do is we allow terms with 0 coefficients. So, like if you just uh, put it like this that this expression is unique then you must insist that the coefficients has to be non-zero. If you allow 0 coefficients certainly like uh, and I, and I writing it as just uh, like this for finite many terms that may not be unique. So, in order to do away with uh, such uh, unpleasant uh, I mean uh, 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 such uh, unpleasant things while uh, talking we simply say that the this expression is unique. Okay. Let me give you some examples then you will understand what do you mean by a basis. So, some example take the simplest possible abelian group namely z. So, then 1 is a basis of z. Okay. But however, 2 is not a basis because uh, if we take 3 it can be written as a sum multiple of 2. This is one example we can keep on moving the go, going ahead z cross z. Okay. So, this has 1 comma 0 and 0 comma 1 this is going to be a basis right. Similarly, for n copies of z that is also going to be a free abelian group and that, that is also uh, going to have the I mean uh, standard basis okay. and so more generally n copies okay. what about other group what about other uh, groups. So, can a, does every group does every abelian group contain uh, necessarily have a basis that is actually not the case because you observe that if S is a basis of G if S is a basis of G then you take any element. So, any group element G of course, it can be written like this n 1 x 1 n k x k where x i's are in x and you further here insist h and i non equal to 0. Now, you see that like uh, for any m, m times g will be m n i x i. So, if m times g is 0 that will force 
that will force from the uniqueness of exception because if this is 0, then that can be written as 0 times x 1 plus plus 0 times x n, I mean having all the coefficients 0 and uh, therefore, uh, from the uniqueness it will force that each a, a m times n i is 0. So, that since uh, n i is non-zero, so that will force m to be 0. Okay. So, what does it, what does that show? It shows that if a group admits a basis, then whatever element you take, whatever element you take, so if it is non-identity, if it is non-zero, then one of these n i's, uh, I mean that then we must have such an expression with exactly with at least one n i non-zero, right. That understand? So, if a S is a basis of a finite abelian, of a abelian group G, then if you take any non-zero element, there exist non-zero integers, n, there exist a k and non-zero integers n on up to n k such that G can be written like this and then we see that G cannot have finite order. Okay. So, if a abelian group admits a basis, then it cannot have any element, it can, so it is all non-identity elements will have infinite order. So, let me define a few terminologies, then we further go ahead. We further go ahead. So, like uh, uh, if G has a basis, Then, so okay. Let me define uh, an uh, terminology. So, G be an abelian group. We uh, we call, call, uh, write down the collection G tor. G tor is the collection of all uh, group elements such that G has finite order. Check that this is a subgroup of G. G to the subgroup of G. So, this is called the, so that is easy to uh, see, it is an abelian group. So, it is called the torsion subgroup of G. So, therefore, when G is finite, see that G equal to G tor when G is finite. And also, you can see there are uh, there, there are abelian groups which are infinite, but every element is of ha having finite order. So, what I mean is that uh, so G is finite is a sufficient condition for being this, but uh, that's not actually necessary. Okay. So now come here. So if G has a basis, then it has to be torsion free. What I mean by this is that is G tor is trivial. So, no non trivial element is having finite order. Okay. So, in particular, if a, if a abelian group is finite, it cannot be, so uh, it cannot admit a basis. Okay. All right. So, I think the notion of a basis of an abelian group is clear, it is almost is exactly similar to that of a basis in a vector space, but we have to make necessary modifications and here, here we did not insist that S will be a finite set, S will be a finite, the basis is having only finitely many elements. So, therefore, thus uh, like uh, uh, we have to say that every group element can be written as a sum like this where all but finitely many coefficients are 0 and this expression is unique. All right. So, if G has a basis, if an abelian group has a basis, then G is said to be free. Okay. So, by a free abelian group, I mean abelian group which admits a basis. Okay. 
the basis need not be finite of a finite subset and uh, G is uh, said to be furthermore a free abelian group is said to be finitely generated if it has a finite basis. Examples? So, these are all finitely generated free abelian groups. In fact, we will show later on that any finitely generated free abelian group must be of this form. So, therefore, right now, so therefore, we actually indeed cannot increase, I mean cannot, cannot uh, uh, bring more examples into the picture because up to isomorphism, these are going to be all examples of finitely generated free abelian groups. Okay. So, the first question of course, here it comes regarding the existence that uh, like that of the question is a situation is exactly similar to that of vector space that given a set, can we have a vector space having S as a basis? The similar question that we pose here is given a set S, non empty set of course, a non empty subset because empty subset, given a non empty set, can we have a, 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 a free abelian group with S as, as a basis? This question is similar. Also, the solutions are also similar. Let me uh, like, uh, first remind, uh, remind you what we did for uh, what we did for vector spaces. So, suppose S was my set, non-empty set, we consider and let F be the field, we consider all functions from S to F such that F S is 0 for all but finitely many S. So, these things we have already uh, uh, considered already so many times. finitely many s. Okay. We have denoted this collection by f of s and we also use a very convenient notation. So, what was that notation? Instead of though the objects are actually functions, instead of f, so given any f, we wrote f as I mean like this. So, f s times uh, s S is in S. So, uh, F S is uh, belongs to F and all, all but finitely when F S is 0. Okay. We use this notation. So, this F S was then, then, then uh, next thing was so, from S to F S, we have a very natural inclusion map from S to F S, we have a very natural include very natural map sending each small x to the to the map who which is taking 1. So, what is this map? So, this is basically a, a this, uh, this is the map that uh, taking the value 1 at s and any other s prime 0. Okay. In notation, this is what we denoted by 1 times s and uh, other coefficients are 0. So, once we, so this is an injective map. So, therefore, then in view of this, we identified s and 1 times s. So, once we identified that, then uh, like uh, Another observation was this 1 times s, this forms a basis of f s. So, these all we have seen for vector spaces, this f s and as I said that since this will be, we identify s and 1 times s. So, therefore, this set will be identified with s. So, therefore, we can now regard s as a basis of f s. Okay. 
So, this is what we have done for vector spaces and then furthermore we had something. So, I am just recalling all of them because the same thing, the similar things we is going to, we are going to have for free abelian groups as well. So, and also, so another thing that if uh, V is a vector space, V is a vector space. V is a vector space such that uh, such that phi we have a map phi from S to V. We have a map such a vector space as the map. Then there exists a unique linear map phi tilde. phi tilde from f s to b such that let me write down the commutative diagram. So, here we have phi. So, from uh, this is the uh, this map is uh, the usual inclusion map. So, unique linear map such that this diagram commutes. Okay. All this we have seen for vector spaces. The similar things are going to hold for, for free abelian groups as well. So, given a non empty set S, given, given a non empty set S, okay. what do we have given a non empty set S? So, here we considered all functions from S to F which uh, so that is to be replaced here by all functions from s to z such that f s is 0 for all world finitely many finitely many s okay. So, this is what we must denote this by z of s. This is certainly uh, an abelian group, is an abelian group, an abelian group, then what else? Like earlier, in fact, these notations we have used several times in vector spaces, then for group rings. So, every f we will write as a useful and handy notation that now each f s is coming from z. So, what how, how is that written? Let me again remind you how, how did we use I mean, how did we like uh, what was the meaning of this notation uh, in uh, what was the meaning of this notation in case of vector space. Okay. So, what was this f s? f s was the value of the function at the point s, right. So, like uh, we will take the function, look at the values of the functions at every points and exactly those values we denote at any given point of point s denote the value of the function at the point s by f s and then we simply write f s times s and then sum and f s is 0 for all but. So, the same thing is going on. Okay. Next, another thing is from S to F S, we do have the S uh, here Z S, we have the map sending each S to the map 1 times S, that is the map that takes where the value 1 at the point S and 0 elsewhere. So, and uh, then we then we use the normal uh, uh, observation that is this set 1 times S s is a basis of of the abelian group z s. Why? Exactly the similar way. So, if you take some, if you take f, right, if you take a, take a function f, so you know that only at for finitely many s s, f s is going to be 0. So, therefore, 
then let's so try to understand that if I if I have one time s for some s, then if I repeat that n times, so basically we are adding that function with n times, then this will be same as n times s, right? n times s. So therefore, it uh, in view of this observation, we see given any f, f should be written as uh, f s times one f s times because f s is an integer, one times s. And of course, uh, let's since uh, this again has a finite sum that we have already said. All right. So this is a basis of ZS, and uh, I mean, given an element, you see that this can be written like this, and uh, and the coefficients have to be unique because the coefficients are the values of done, but the values, this nothing but the values of that function. So given a function, these values are unique. So again, try to understand that suppose a function f is of this form, of this form, then from the right hand side by definition, the definition of this notation, the right hand side stands for the function that takes the value n s at the given, at any, uh, at the point s, okay. So since right hand and left hand side are same, n s has to be f of s. So that shows that like uh, this, uh, that shows that uh, this expression has to be unique. So, as a quick argument, we prove that uh, quick argument we prove that uh, this is going to be a ZS is going to be a basis of S. And then, furthermore, like earlier, we will uh, identify S with one times S. Therefore, this set will be identified with S. So, thus. We now we can say that S is a basis of ZS and the similar thing also holds here. Okay. Similar thing also holds here. So, uh, so, just uh, let us uh, see uh, here. Uh, uh, so, if, uh, if uh, let us say A is an abelian group, if A is an abelian group and from S to A you have a map phi, then this extends to a group homomorphism from Z s to a phi tilde, a group homomorphism. How is phi tilde defined? You take a typical element from Z x, it looks like this, right. So, you simply send that to phi s. So, the same thing that we have done for uh, vector spaces and as expected this sum is also finite sum because all about finite when n and s are 0. So, uh, yeah, so still this expression is unique. So, there is no def uh, confusion regarding the definition of the map and then verification of uh, that this is a homomorphism and of commutes this. These are quite routine things and uh, hence I am leaving that to you. So, the upshot is like this property which we usually call as universal property that holds here as well. That is whenever we are having a map from S to A that will extend to a, so given a set A and an abelian group, given a set S and an abelian group A, whenever we have a map from S to A, that map extends to a group homomorphism from the free abelian group with basis as S, from the free abelian group to A, okay. Uh, yeah, so the similar phenomenon uh, holds here too. So that shows the, like any, any given S, that shows the existence of a free abelian group with S as its basis. Okay. Now uh, let me get a go for. Uh, I mean, let me move towards the main, uh, the fundamental uh, properties, the fundamental uh, properties of free abelian groups. So, like as I said, that finitely uh, a fi an ab free abelian group. So, yeah, the free abelian group is said to be finitely generated if that has a finite basis, 
okay so like that of vector space uh, you should uh, like it's not it's not unnatural to expect that if we are having a finitely generated if we are having a finitely generated free abelian group then any subgroup of that will also be finitely generated and in fact it will be it will be the uh, well we, uh, of course we also should expect the following that uh, for a finitely generated free abelian group any two bases will have same number of elements so it's, it's just the analog of dimension of vector spaces for let's say for finite dimensional vector spaces so we should have the analog that any two bases we should have same number of elements and that number we want to call it something in case of vector space the term was dimension here we would uh, we will call it uh, it is the rank of the abelian free abelian group provided we are able to settle the issue that any two vector spaces any any, any two bases will have same number of elements and also then uh, we will also uh, we would also like to have that if for a finitely i mean if uh, we are given a finite if sorry if you were given a free abelian group with rank n then any subgroup of that free abelian group will also be a free abelian group and it will have rank less or equal to n so all these results similar to that of uh, vector spaces finite dimensional vector spaces you should expect here in fact we will prove them one by one so first i need uh, this uh, proposition which will be helpful uh, what does the proposition say so let given two abelian groups a and a prime given abelian groups a and a prime a prime is free assume a prime is free that is a prime is having a basis i not insist this will be finitely generated a prime will be a basis a prime free and a subjective homomorphism homomorphism for f from a to a prime so what are given to us to abelian groups with a prime is a prime is a free, a free abelian group and a subjective homomorphism f okay there exist a subgroup there exists a subgroup C such that first of all A will be kernel of F plus C and restriction of F to C is an isomorphism, isomorphism C to A prime. So, this is again this result is also quite similar to that of finite dimensional vector spaces given a subjective linear map you take a complementary subspace of the kernel then the restriction of the linear map to the complementary subspace will be an isomorphism and of course, uh, because it is a complementary this is what is going to happen. So, we are going to prove this result in this situation remember it does not hold for arbitrary abelian groups we need this to be free. Okay. So, what uh, the proof goes in the I mean proof is very straightforward I would say. So, A prime is free. So, therefore, let uh, let uh, x i uh, let x i uh, let x i uh, be a basis basis of A prime ok from surjectivity there exist x i prime in A such that f x i prime is x i well I should rather I should put y i y i for all i ok. Next, next C let C be the subgroup generated by so the proof is very simple I would say again. So, 
so the uh, de define let us see C be the subgroup generated by these elements ok. We have already defined in this class what the, the meaning of uh, saying a subgroup of a given group generated by a given subset ok. So now, uh, uh, so now we are going to prove these two statements. So the first claim is C. So this is a basis of C. Is a basis of C. That is actually quite easy to say. So of course, uh, like. Uh, in order to show this is a basis, what we have to show that every element in C admits a unique expression as a combination of y i's. Since C is generated by this, so at least this is clear that given any like given any x in C, there, there, there exist n i's all were finitely many 0. zero such that x is equals to summation x i n i. So, n i x uh, y i ok that part is there. Now, I have to show that this n i's are this n i's are unique ok. So, how to show that if x is suppose it, it admits some other expression again the same again the same uh, condition that all were finitely when m i's are 0, then I will consider f of x. So, from here f of x will be in one hand m i x i's on the other hand from here it will be summation n i x i's since x i is a basis of x i is a basis of a prime that will force each m i to be n i ok. That is quite clear. In fact, like uh, like a vector space, the uniqueness of expression can be equivalently formulated as if a such a finite sum vanishes, then each coefficient has to vanish. The exactly same way. So, therefore, uh, uh, like I think again, uh, let me again repeat that uh, the for free abelian groups also that e every group element can be read as a unique expression that. I mean this uniqueness part can be equivalently formulated to as follows that if an expression summation n i x i is 0 then each x n i is 0 that that is equivalent to the uniqueness part. The argument is exact the just exactly same as that of uh, vector spaces. So, maybe in that way you can also do. So, now we have established our claim that this is a basis of C. So, the rest becomes quite easy now this becomes very easy now. So, like let us come here uh, mm, ok. So, the, the the what we have done is from that this this becomes obvious right ok. I think uh, I think uh, let, let me do it one by one. So, let us start with some g in a some some x in a x in a send it f x, f x will be for some n i's again all but finitely many 0 ok. So, therefore, therefore that forces f of x minus is to be 0 right because f of y is 0 therefore, this fellow lies in the kernel of f. So, thus we have proved that every group element can be written as a sum of some element of the kernel and something from C. Now, in order to show uh, it is direct, what we do is take something. 
So this is just the say, abelian group. This is the direction of its subgroups. So it's enough to show the intersection is intersection is uh, zero in trivial. So the let Z belongs to kernel F intersection C. Okay. Therefore, it's easy to see that Z will be some n i times y i, then since z is in kernel as well, f z will be n i x i, but uh, since z is in kernel, this is 0, that will force each n i to be 0. So, these are very straightforward arguments. So, therefore, z will be trivial. Hence, uh, this is done and uh, the, uh, it is almost done. Let me just once again check. So, the map, uh, the, the restriction of f up on c. So, first of all, it is easy to see that this is surjective, right? This is surjective because uh, a typical element in A prime will look like x i. So, you see that the for this element from c, this maps to this from the uh, by definition. So, this map is surjective. is on to and 1 1 means, so you have to show that the kernel is, you have to show that the kernel is trivial. So, kernel of, if something lies in the kernel of uh, this restriction map, so if let us say z is in the kernel of the f restricted to c, then that means z is in the kernel of f as well and z is in c. So, what we have just observed or that is from the direction it fall all follows that z has to be trivial. So, so these are since these arguments are quite straightforward, I am not uh, writing with all the details, I am just writing some of the main steps and uh, tell you, uh, I mean explaining orally. I hope that you can just, since you can also see that the arguments are quite straightforward. So, even from uh, as I said the oral explanations, you can uh, fill up the details, you can work out all the details if necessary. Kernel of FC. Is, uh, is is of course a subs, uh, uh, subset of kernel f kernel f contains c which is trivial so this shows if uh, this is one one okay. so yeah so this is what uh, we have uh, so uh, obtained so this proposition proposition is going to uh, going to uh, be the main, I mean is going to be very useful for us in the subsequent and in, uh, what in, in what is come in what uh, we are going to discuss in the rest of uh, this uh, course. In fact, uh, in fact we will show that with, with, with the help of this proposition we will show that uh, uh, this uniqueness of rank and other things. Okay. So, the next lecture will continue with uh, free abelian, yeah, with, with free abelian groups and uh, arrive at its uh, structure theorem. Yeah, okay. So, with that, I finish this lecture.